The Peter Schiff Show. Well, Friday the 13th wasn't unlucky on Wall Street. The markets rose that S&P 500 traded to a new all-time record high. Uh, Not quite so for the Dow. I guess a record high in the Dow is going to have to wait till next week. But we did manage to close above 18,000. The Nasdaq, not at a new record high, but it certainly has broken out to almost a 15-year high. I mean, the only time the, the Nasdaq was higher than this was in March of 2000 when it got to 5,100 and change. Right now, we close at 4,893, so uh, very close to 4,900. Again, if we get above 4,900, it'll be the first time we've been above 4,900 since March of 2000. Uh, So a huge uh, rally going on in the U.S. stock market. But this rally is coming despite... Weak corporate earnings, uh, down, earnings uh, downgrades coming by companies, companies issuing warnings that their earnings are not going to uh, meet expectations. There have been some stocks that have reported better than expected earnings, but the overall trend is weaker earnings. And of course, many companies are using the dollar as an excuse as to why their earnings are down. But nonetheless, uh, lower earnings, we're certainly getting weak economic data, the economic data Uh, you know, is trickling in or it's a flood. Uh, The market seems to be uh, buried beneath a deluge of um, bad economic news, but it doesn't seem to dampen the spirits on Wall Street. It is, though, beginning to dampen uh, some of the spirits on Main Street. I'm going to get into some of these consumer confidence numbers that have dropped uh, precipitously this week. But, hey, you know, Wall Street has continued to be as confident as ever, uh, despite Uh, The weakness in the consumer, the weakness in the economy, the weakness in corporate earnings, none of it is stopping the markets from rising. And again, I think what's really powering the markets is the Fed, not only the Fed, but the ECB, the Bank of Japan, Bank of China, uh, the, the Swedish bank, the Swiss bank, all the banks, you know, Sweden just this week joined the QE club as if the, their currency hadn't lost enough value last year. They decided they needed to push it even lower uh, by launching a QE program. But it's all this liquidity. That's where these markets are floating on. And if the Fed is going to keep creating money, and I think this weak economic news, again, is propping up the markets because it takes the rate hikes off the table, even if people don't want to acknowledge it yet. But I think eventually that is exactly what is going to happen. But Let me look at some of the economic news that has come out since my last uh, podcast. On Wednesday, we did get the mortgage, weekly mortgage applications, which plunged. It was a 9% drop on the composite index. Uh, Breaking it down, the decline in purchases was a 7% decline. That followed a 2% decline in the week prior. And the refinance index, just with a small uptick in mortgage rates, We had a 10% decline in mortgage refinances. So obviously, you know, this shows a negative for the housing market and for the uh, consumer's ability to refinance his mortgage to save some money so we can spend the difference at the mall. But we got the jobless claims that came out on, on Thursday, the weekly number. And I've been talking about how this trend has turned higher. And we got a big jump up. We got a 25,000 claim increase over the prior week, which was revised up by 1,000. But so last week, we were 279,000 claims. And the most recent week, it's 304,000 claims. And, you know, I'm watching on CNBC when they announced this. And I'm not making this up, although I don't think we have the sound from it. I didn't ask for it. But um, Steve Leisman, when the, the news is released, he basically says, well, yeah, we got this big jump in employment claims, but no one's really going to pay much attention to that because we all know how strong the labor market is. Okay, so we all know how strong the labor market is. Therefore, we will, you know, refuse to acknowledge any data that might contradict that view, right? We know the labor market is strong. And so if there's any data that suggests that it's not as strong as we think, well, we'll just ignore that data uh, because we know it's strong, right? No matter how weak the data is we don't care because we're convinced the market is strong. It shows you how difficult it is for Wall Street to shake this. You know, once it's got 
it, this bit in its mouth, it, it's not, it's not going to let go. The worst no- news we got that day, though, was retail sales. Now, retail sales were down 0.9% in the month of December, and they were looking for another decline in January, but only five-tenths. Instead, we got eight-tenths. So almost twice, uh, 80, not quite twice, so 80% bigger drop than they thought. Take out automobiles. Again, the, the drop was nine-tenths when they were expecting uh, minus five-tenths. And then that comes on the heels of another 0.9% decline in December. And even if you strip out gasoline, there was a slight uptick, 0.2%. If you take out gas and autos, it was up 02 but uh, they were looking for up 04 So again, half the expectation. In fact, this is the biggest back-to-back decline uh, in, in retail sales since October of 2009. You know, that's, you know, that's the depth of the, uh, the Great Recession. So, you know, th- this is a big feat to have that big a decline. And, you know, everybody was assuming that, well, you know, the money that wasn't spent at the gas station, consumers were going to spend that money someplace else. Well, so far, the data does not bear that out because the spending is not showing up someplace else. That was just wishful thinking. Also, we got consumer confidence numbers that came out from a Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index, and that was down uh, from the prior week. In fact, it was the down for two weeks in a row. And again, that's the first time that's happened in, in a while that we've seen back-to-back weekly declines in, um, in, consumer, in consumer confidence. I think that the last time that happened was, uh, was September of, of last year. But again, you know, Wall Street didn't seem to care about, about that news. They just kind of shrugged it off. Uh, But I think probably one of the worst pieces of data that came out, because it reflects upon fourth quarter GDP. And we've already seen all sorts of reasons why I believe that we're going to see big down revisions in fourth quarter GDP. Uh, You know, the biggest one being the huge jump in the trade deficit in December, much bigger than they thought, which subtracts from GDP. But this is inventories, business inventories. And they were supposed to rise by 02 Instead, they they only rose by 0.1, which is a very, very small increase in in, in, in inventory. And if you look at the, the sales numbers, sales have declined dramatically. So if you look at the inventory to sales ratio, right, this is the highest it's been since July of 2009. Again, what that indicates is that businesses are not able to sell their inventory. Right. Their inventories are building faster than their sales. It means they have too much inventory. And remember, I said that one of the reasons that Q3 GDP was so good is because businesses loaded up on inventory because they thought the economy would be strong and they would sell it. But the, 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 the rising inventory to sales ratio is showing you that the businesses screwed up. They bought too much stuff. And so that big GDP number is at the expense of lower GDP numbers we're getting in the future because now businesses have too much stuff. And they have to let their inventories run down. So they're not going to buy as much stuff because they can't sell the stuff that they already bought. So all this, number one, means that the fourth quarter GDP is going to be lower now again because of the build in inventories uh, uh, or the smaller build. But it also means that first quarter, the quarter we're in now, uh, is going to be impacted because businesses are not going to have to order as much stuff because they already have a lot of stuff that they, they already ordered last year that they haven't sold. So that was more weak economic news coming out. So again, weak confidence, weak uh, inventories, uh, weak sales numbers. Uh, in fact, it, 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 inside inside that report, you had you had a big you had a big decline in uh, in sales. I mean, I'm trying to see if I could find the number here. Yes, yeah, sales fell 0.9% in that report. That was the biggest decline in a year, and it's the fifth consecutive monthly decline, five months in a row. Yet Wall Street is talking about this strong U.S. economy, and you get really, really weak numbers like that. And, you know, th- we continued this today. 
you know, we got the import export prices, which showed big declines year over year. Import prices down 8%, export prices down 5.4%. Again, this is the kind of stuff the Fed's not going to like that. Right. There's nothing wrong with these prices coming down. But how is the Fed going to react to that? Because the Fed says they want inflation. So are they going to be raising rates uh, with uh, import and export prices declining? But the big news that they ignored was the huge drop in the uh, consumer sentiment survey that came out for the month of February. And last month. The number was at a record. The sentiment level was at ninety eight point one. It was the highest it had been in 13 years. And they were looking for it to increase. The consensus was that it was going to inch up to 98.5. Instead, it plunged all the way down to 93.6. Now, 93.6 is still big, but it's a lot lower than 98.5. In fact, this is the biggest miss versus what had been expected in the history of this study, this, 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 this index. So everybody was looking for consumers to be more confident. Instead, they're a lot less confident. And I think this is probably the beginning of a trend because we had a steady increase in confidence for five months in a row. And now I think it's peaked and now we're falling fast. Uh, So consumers are losing confidence in this phony recovery. It seems their part time jobs are not enough uh, to buy the things that they need. They got a short term boost from the uh, fall in gasoline prices, but gasoline prices have been rising. You know, Brent, uh, Brent crude is above $60 now. West Texas uh, closed above 52, uh, 52.60. To me, the market looks stronger. I think a lot of people are short the oil market. In fact, I think one of the reasons we had this big rise in the stock market is I think there is a lot of short covering this week. I think a lot of people who got short uh, had to cover. Maybe they thought that there'd be some weakness based on weak economic data, and they didn't get it. And so they had, to, they had to cover those positions. Well, I think we've had a lot of people shorting the oil market over the last week. Everybody just said that, you know, thought this was a dead cat bounce. You know, we went down to 42, 43. Then we had a $10, $12 rally. And I think a lot of shorts jumped on that rally. I think there are a lot of people now short the market. I think we can have a short squeeze there as well. I think we could see another big bounce in the price of oil. And, of course, oil prices are already rising at the gas station, right? So the trend of oil prices at the pump, that's ended. They've been rising now for a couple of weeks, and they can continue to rise. We may have seen the lows. And so whatever bump the consumer had in their confidence based on oil prices going down, well, now oil prices are going back up. But we already know now that there was no big windfall for the economy uh, because consumers have so many other problems to worry about that the fact that they got a little bit of relief at the gas pump didn't mean they rushed into the into the department store and bought some new stuff. It just means they didn't have to run up their credit cards as much now to buy food or to pay for their expensive health insurance. Thanks to uh, thanks to Obamacare. Gold gold is was trying to recover all week from the shellacking it got on last Friday in response to the better-than-expected non-farm payroll number, which got everybody thinking, oh, the economy is really strong, Uh, the Fed is going to raise rates, and so the dollar, you know, gold got clobbered that day. And it has been inching back, but, you know, didn't come close to recouping what it lost last Friday. Uh, And, of course, the volume. You had huge volume on that decline and not nearly as much volume on this because, you know, that was a big deal that payroll number but the fact of the matter is all the data that has come out since that payroll number has been at negative yet the gold market doesn't get any near the the upside bounce from negative economic news as it does when the news is positive but i think it's because it's the jobs number i think that since janet yellen and the fed are focused on jobs that's the economic data point that all the traders are fixated on but they don't seem to understand if all the other numbers are weak then the jobs numbers are going to follow. See, these jobs numbers are a lagging indicator. You're looking in the rearview mirror when you're looking at all the jobs we created in 2014. you got to look at where the economy is now and where it's headed. And if the economy is as weak as the data suggests, then a lot of these jobs are going to go away. And as I I mentioned before, a lot of these jobs are are simply part-time jobs. I mean, that's the reason that there's so many jobs is because so many people are working part-time. And when people are sharing jobs, which in effect 
they're doing thanks to Obamacare, employers are forced to share jobs. Instead of giving one person a full job, they got to have two people share a job so that they don't have to provide health insurance. When you have job sharing, a lot more people have jobs, but they don't have good jobs. They don't have full-time jobs. And so the numbers are kind of padded uh, by this new reality, and people are not factoring that in. They're just looking at the numbers and accepting them on face value because it serves their narrative. It makes it easier for them to pretend the economy is good. So they don't, they don't want to spend the time to dig beneath the surface. Maybe because they don't they, they, they don't want to. They don't want to know the truth. So they'll just uh, conveniently believe a lie because it's more comfortable than, than digging out the truth. But I think that as we continue to see more and more evidence that the economy is a lot weaker than people think, uh, you're going to start to see uh, the gold market moving much, much higher. And of course, eventually, these non-farm payroll numbers are going to start to come out weak. You know, it's got to happen. And when it does, you know, it's going to be a big surprise and it could be a violent rally. In fact, this is going to, you know, be a two-way street when it comes to the part-time workforce, because it helped the numbers on the way up, right? Because employers had to hire part-time workers uh, rather than full-time workers. They did hire more people in numbers. They did create more jobs, but it works the same way on the downside. When employers decide they need to reduce their payroll, they need to uh, have fewer hours worked, uh, they're going to be firing more people, right? Because if they want to, if they want to cut, you know, let's say they're looking at the hourly pay, and they want to get rid of, you know, 80 hours. Well, if 80 hours used to be two people working uh, 40 hours, but now it's uh, two people working 30 hours and another guy working 20, right? So now they got to hire fire three people to reduce their their labor costs by 80 hours, not two. So it's going to work the same way. They're going to you're going to have bigger job losses in the part time economy uh, to offset the bigger job gains in the part-time economy. So it's going to, you know, it's going to be a, you know, vicious on the way down. It was virtuous on the way up from the point of view of the statistics, but it's going to be uh, vicious on the way down. Now, on another note, I noticed a, a survey that is put out by Reporters Without Borders, and they put out an annual survey, World Press Freedom Index. And we came out, America, as number 49 on this index, meaning that there are 40 other countries where there is more freedom of the press than America, where we have freedom of the press guaranteed to us in the Bill of Rights. In fact, it's the very first uh, bill, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's the First Amendment, uh, freedom of the press. Yet despite that, there are 48 other countries that rank higher than us when it comes to freedom of the press. Now, last year, we were in 32nd place. So uh, that's a pretty big decline in just one year. So I wonder where we're going to be in 2015, uh, because obviously the direction uh, is not good. But this is just another indication. You know, there are a lot of other studies that come out that rank uh, economic freedom, uh, things like that. And America continues to notch lower and lower relative to other countries. And of course, freedom and prosperity go hand in hand. And as governments become bigger and freedoms become fewer, uh, you know, you retard economic growth. And and then it also becomes a self-perpetuating spiral because as the economies get weak, the government uses that weakness to usurp more power because now, you know, you create the despair among the people and now the government can promise some kind of relief in exchange for more power, which they get. And then when they have more power, you sacrifice more individual liberty, more freedom. And then, of course, as things get bad, you always have some dissent. You always, ha- always have people that want to rightly blame the government. And now the government reacts uh, with oppressive legislation. And, of course, as you have real economic chaos and people are looking to protect their wealth or maybe get their money out of the country, well, they crack down on that. And so oppressive governments uh, tend to uh, take away freedom of individuals to uh, protest, to dissent, to leave. And of course, when you have a, a big government that limits your freedom, well, then you have a less vibrant economy, you have more poverty, you, know, you, know, you have less economic growth. So again, they, 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 they feed on each other. So it's no surprise that you know, the U.S. Is, is notching down uh, in all of these metrics, which is unfortunate. I mean, we should be number one in everything we, it's when it comes to freedom. You know, uh, but unfortunately, we're not. I'm sure if they were doing these surveys 100 years ago, uh, 
America would be number one in economic freedom, freedom of the press. There probably wasn't anything, you know, back then uh, where we weren't the freest. But to think that, you know, there are 48 countries that the Reporters Without Borders, probably not a very conservative, you know, li- you know, right wing type organization. I would imagine there's a lot of uh, liberals uh, that are, you know, in that organization. And and yet, you know, this is where the United States ranks. Ranks is number 49. Now, who knows? Maybe they're being generous. Maybe they're maybe there's a bias in there. Maybe we're actually lower than that. You know, maybe, you know, maybe we're benefiting, get the benefit of the doubt here on some of the countries that we were able to edge out. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro-Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro-Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies.